Hi, good evening, everyone. I am uh, I'm would like to welcome you to LA Print Edition 11. I'm Leslie Jones, Curator of Modern and Contemporary Prints and Drawings at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And it is my pleasure to launch this evening's program devoted to activist graphics. For those of you attending the program for the first time, LA Print is an annual event focused on printmaking and print publishing in Los Angeles. It was launched in 2010 by the Museum's Prints and Drawings Council as a way to acknowledge and celebrate the region's vibrant print culture. In past years, we have devoted the program to notable print workshops like Cirrus Editions and Elmo Paul Press, or to printmaking techniques like screen print. Edition nine of LA Print was devoted to women of the LA print world. Tonight's theme relates to the current exhibition on view at the Riverside Art Museum titled, What Would You Say? Activist Graphics from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. This exhibition was organized by my LACMA colleague, Stacy Steinberger, Associate Curator of Decorative Arts and Design, and she will be moderating tonight's program. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Stacy for agreeing to take on this event, in addition to all her other projects, and for sharing her knowledge and appreciation of this important aspect of contemporary printmaking. I'd also like to thank Gabriela Martinez from Education and Public Programs for her helpful input and taking care with all the preparations. Again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I, for one, am very excited um, to hear from the artists tonight and I hope you enjoy LA Print. I will now turn it over to Alexa, Alexa Ramirez who will be introducing tonight's panelists. Alexa. Hi, print lovers and makers. Uh, welcome to edition 11 of LA Print, a public program exploring current trends in printmaking and print publishing in Los Angeles. My name is Alexa Ramirez. I am the Mellon Mays Undergrad Curatorial Fellow in the Decorative Arts and Design Department. Today, we will be discussing some of printmaking's impact on our world through the lenses of three outstanding artists, Alvaro Marquez, Ashley Lukashevsky, and MJ Balvanera. Alvaro Marquez is a Los Angeles-based visual artist, educator, and researcher who utilizes their multidisciplinary printmaking practice to inter integra interrogate the long history of displacement in the Americas, from indigenous dispossession and genocide to current issues around gentrification and homelessness. Our second panelist, MJ Balvanera, is a graphic designer born in Ciudad de Mexico, where her work is currently based and has also spent considerable time printmaking in LA. She practices publishing as a form of protest against Eurocentric visual standards, embracing it as a vehicle for individual and cultural expression. Lastly, Ashley Lukashevsky is an illustrator and visual artist who lives and works between Los Angeles and Honolulu, Hawaii. They use illustration and visual art to engage social movements in their intersections of racial, immigrant, and climate justice, as well as mental health and queer liberation. Thank you all so much again for joining us. I will now turn it over to my colleague and the moderator for this evening's conversation, Stacey Steinberger, Associate Curator of Decorative Arts and Design here at LACMA, who will start by talking about the history of activist graphics in Los Angeles. Thank you, Alexa, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, our plans for tonight's program grew out of the exhibition, What Would You Say? Activist Graphics from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which is on view through August 7th at the Riverside Art Museum. Um, from there, it travels to California State University Northridge Art Gallery and the Vincent Price Art Museum as part of our local access partnership made par possible by the Art Bridges Initiative. The exhibition explores the intersection of art, design, and political activism in California from the late 1960s through the present. It's not a comprehensive look at the subject. It would take a much, much larger project to address all of the important issues and movements that have taken root in the state. Instead, the show uses works from LACMA's collections to explore the ways that designers and artists use their talents and professional skills to champion civil rights, oppose wars and injustice, and press for change. Tonight, I'll showcase six of the over 50 works on the show to talk about some of the themes um, for tonight's conversation. So the exhibition title comes from this striking poster, which was created for a printing workshop at the Graphic Center associated with the Women's Building, a legendary feminist art space founded in Los Angeles in 1973. One of the 
building's co-founders, graphic designer Sheila de Bretville, set up the Graphic Center as a way to teach women how to use printing tools, providing them with the means to disseminate their perspective in a culture that largely silenced women's voices. The bold stripe of printing ink insists that women have a mark to make on the world. Printmaking has long played an essential role in movements for social justice. Artists and activists distill complex issues into eye-catching images and capture the emotional nuances behind the news. They often turn to printmaking techniques, historically woodcuts, lino cuts, and then screen printing, um, to reproduce and disseminate those visual messages. Many formed workshops to teach others how to create their own prints, building movements by spreading artistic skills. Printmaking workshops have been occasions of community building and expressions of solidarity. While tonight's event focuses on Los Angeles, the exhibition includes works from across California. In the early 1970s, artists and student activists formed screen printing workshops to create large volumes of posters um, for the anti-Vietnam War movement and the civil rights movement. Skilled practitioners like Chicano artists Malakias Montoya and Rupert Garcia trained others in these tools, continuing a tradition of activist printmaking in the Bay Area where they lived. These images spread widely, both through exhibitions and also through production. This powerful Garcia screen print calling for the release of wrongfully convicted black activist Angela Davis was reproduced for wider distribution by the Peace Press in Los Angeles, demonstrating the important networks of activist printers and printmakers. Screen printing played a central role in Los Angeles as well. Influential educator Carita Kent embraced the medium because it was easy to teach and made it possible to create the inexpensive works of art to create to create inexpensive works of art and protest. Carita, who was a sister of the Order of the Immaculate Heart of Mary until 1968, confronted political issues like the Vietnam War and racist oppression with moral urgency. Even though she wasn't comfortable leading marches and rallies herself, she saw her artwork as helping to build movements for change. As she described it, quote, using words with visual forms and just short passages is often a way to help awaken people to something they may not be aware of, rather than enclosing it in a book or making a speech about it. One of her students, Sister Karen Boccolero, went on to co-found one of the central homes for activist printmaking in Los Angeles. Self-help graphics and art, um, which opened in East Los Angeles in the early 1970s. Since then, it has been a home for artists, particularly in the Chicanx and Latinx communities, to teach and learn printmaking and produce powerful works of art, many addressing important issues facing communities of color. The exhibition highlights one important workshop, the first Mujeres Atelier, organized by artist Irena Cervantes in 1999. Cervantes invited 10 artists, all women of color, to participate. This intergenerational cohort met regularly to share not only printmaking techniques, but also to work through issues of feminism, identity, and spirituality together. As the atelier demonstrates, printmaking can be the occasion not only for protest, but also for a more holistic approach to change, creating space to imagine a more inclusive and supportive world. Next slide. Relief and screen printing techniques are often associated with political printmaking as well as fine arts, but many artists and designers have turned to more strictly commercial processes in order to mass produce their messages. Painter Robbie Canal used printing to reach a broader audience, saying in one interview, quote, given the public issues I was trying to address, the audience I could reach by showing in a commercial gallery seemed too narrowly circumscribed, not only in terms of numbers, but also in terms of class education and the amount of free time on their hands. Beginning in the 1980s, he literally took to the streets. Working with the publisher Typecraft, he produced offset posters. His distinctive acerbic graphics gained a devoted following. He built a crew of volunteers who gathered at night to illegally install each new graphic on traffic switch boxes and other visible locations. Um, in their efforts to spread urgent messages of change, designers adopted even more affordable means of reproduction. After all, justice movements don't generally come with big budgets. Sheila de Bretville taught her students to use Diazzo, a cheap blueprint technique used in architecture and engineering. Others use risograph printing, as you'll hear more about later. Next slide. In recent decades, the joint necessity of reaching as many people as possible, as economically as possible, has led many artists and activists to online distribution. By the turn of the 21st century, artists and designers around the world, including in California, created websites to distribute free downloadable graphics that activists could print themselves. Many work in multiple formats. LA artist Ernesta Urania creates one-off one works as well as limited edition stencil and screen prints. But many of his best known images are also available online. His iconic 2017 poster depicting longtime Lakota activist Helen Redfeather was published in offset lithograph by the aptly named Amplifier Foundation, who also made it available for free download. Social media has also emerged as a major way that artists can disseminate messages of change. 
During the pandemic, this already established method of communication accelerated as artists lost access to studios and printmaking tools and supply chains were disrupted. Meanwhile, digital graphics circulated online, galvanating protesters around the Black Lives Matter movement and other important issues. Yet for many artists, print and the legacy of activist printmaking still has a role to play, as we'll be discussing this evening. As you can see, we have a lot to talk about. Um, so let's get started and hear from our guests about their work, uh, beginning with Alvaro. Thank you so much, Stacey, and uh, thank you all for this invitation. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the work that I've done today uh, throughout my career as a printmaker. Uh, this first piece that is on display here is actually from some work that I did in 2017, uh, addressing the, uh, the issues around undocumented migration. Um, prior to pursuing a career as a printmaker, I was actually a PhD student studying ethnic studies, um, looking at visual culture and migration. And it, through the course of my studies, I came to the conclusion that I didn't want to create um, written scholarly work about the themes that I was researching. And instead, I wanted to take the archival impulse and turn it uh, towards my art making. And in this series, I was I created a series of 12 lino cut prints that tell a story through images of undocumented migration. In it, I focus on the story of our protagonist, who you see here exchanging money with a coyote as they're uh, getting in a, in a truck to be smuggled across the US-Mexico border. Uh, my initial interest in printmaking really emerged from my love of the Taller de Grafica Popular um, and the work of of the printmakers coming out of Mexico City that did such important work in terms of um, advancing the ideals of the Mexican revolution and promoting an egalitarian society. And I was really taken by the limitations of this, uh, of black and white imagery in lino cuts. Uh, next slide. Uh, this image here is also from the same series, uh, which is called La Norte Patras. Uh, which was actually printed at Self-Help Graphics. So I'm really honored and, and grateful that I had the opportunity to step into Self-Help Graphics where I really dove into printmaking before pursuing my MFA in printmaking. In this image, I was trying to show the ways that migrants maintain relationships across the border, um, particularly interested in how it is that particular technologies that emerge in different time periods allow for this sense of connection. Uh, nowadays, we have apps like WhatsApp, uh, where people can communicate freely and cheaply. But in the time that my father was growing up, when he was an undocumented immigrant, the only way that he could communicate was through the landline. So I wanted to create these linkages um, in, in terms of how it is that people build community across space. But again, in this work, I was really trying to chase the work of the Taller de Grafica Popular and, their, and the mark making of somebody like Leopoldo Mendes. Uh, but ultimately what emerged from this work was an idea that the best way to reach people about this important topic wouldn't be through a scholarly article that is hidden behind paywalls, but to distribute images that tell this story to populations that do not rely on the written word as the primary means of knowledge. And I think about uh, really the, the, the political impulse of printmaking here to make information and experiences widely accessible. So next slide. Um, in this image, which I made during the lockdown in 2021, I was invited by the US Department of Arts and Culture, which is a guerrilla nonprofit organization. And they invited me to create a piece of work that addressed housing issues, since a lot of my work is thinking critically about private property and home ownership and displacement. And they paired me up with an organization in the Bay Area that is fighting, fighting for housing rights. And I used my very traditional lino cut uh, technique to produce the center image and created the rest with the help of Adobe Photoshop and, um, and other digital technologies since I did not have access to a studio, much like Stacy was talking about. Next slide. 
Uh, my most recent work, which is currently on display across the street from LACMA at the Craft Contemporary Museum, is an installation that explores the relationship between unhoused populations and indigenous displacement, thinking a lot about the role of Spanish colonization in the Americas and bringing notions of private property and this idea that land could be a commodity that could be traded as a good. Uh, it's an installation, but if you see on the tags here, I use lino cut based elements because I want to continue sort of this visual grammar I think of in terms of the mark making of printmaking that I think hopefully bridges the, this, this um, installation approach with traditional printmaking techniques. Next slide. And here you see the entire installation, which is called Private Geometries. And the images you see on the wall are actually uh, tents uh, that represent the tents that unhoused people use in the streets of Los Angeles. And, in, and Tongva Keys, which are traditional Tongva dwellings. And the idea was to make this linkage that to understand displacement here in what we now call Los Angeles, we have to go back to the colonial encounter to think about the first wave of displacement, which shaped this county. And now I'd like to present my, our next guest, which is MJ Barbanera. Thank you so much. Alvaro, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everyone involved at LACMA for the, um, for the invitation. Um, so my name is MJ Barbanera. I'm originally from Mexico City, born and raised. Um, so a lot of my work gravitates around Mexico City and Mexican identity. This first project that I have up here is kind of a culmination of an idea around Mexican identity and what it represents, and then also the deep history of printmaking, which Alvaro touched upon in Taller de Grafica Popular um, and the revolution. So what this project is here is a series of business cards that were printed in a very particular place in Mexico City called uh, Plaza Santo Domingo. It's a place kind of stuck in time where there are still people with their letterpress, um, the little small letter press making business cards out of um, letter press um, modules. And uh, I wanted to really explore what the history of, of printmaking was in Mexico City. And at the same time, explore what the role of a printmaker is when I myself as a designer is in more of a collaborative relationship rather than a dictatorship relationship. So I asked this printmaker to start creating speculative business cards for different characters within the space. So for example, uh, one of the business cards says ladrillo, which means brick 52B. And I asked the printmaker to just explore whatever these different characters represented to him. Um, I think in general, it was just a deep exploration into what the history of printmaking is in Mexico. Um, next slide. So I, like I said, I grew up in Mexico, in Mexico City, and I moved to LA in 2015. Um, and that is where I started to get introduced to the world of Rezo printing. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit what Rezo printing is. I have a feeling that most people know, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Um, Rezo printing is kind of a digital a screen printing process. Um, you can see the machine here looks a little bit like a Xerox machine that you would find at an office. Um, it uses direct ink. So it has these large tubes that are the drums. And it was designed originally in Japan, it's a Japanese machine um, for very fast kind of lo-fi um, print production. In recent years, Rezo printing has become really popular and it is very popular because you are able to print these beautiful bright colors and artists have been using Rezo printing to showcase their work. Um, and for myself, being introduced to the LA scene and then to Rezo printing, I started to think about Rezo printing more as a political means of production um, rather than just a kind of like a, a, a beautiful machine, so to say. Um, so I'll get into what I mean by political means of production on the next slides, please. 
So when I moved to LA, I was fortunate enough to get to work at the Women's Center for Creative Work, which is now known as the Feminist Center for Creative Work. Um, Stacey was talking a little bit about this space, um, the print shop that was um, held at the, at the women's building. Um, and I was lucky enough to find an unused risograph at the back of the space where I kind of just naively decided to start a press. So with that, Co-Conspirator Press was born and kind of the ideology behind this was to give platform to underrepresented communities through their uh, authorship, making books through typography and through the risograph. So this particular book here, Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication was the first book we produced, the first out of nine over the course of uh, two years, which was kind of crazy. Um, and yeah, I think just in general, it was really rewarding to be able to work on this project and um, to give a platform to underrepresented communities, but also an income. So we, um, yeah, you know, people would buy the book and then the author would receive money and so would the press. So it, it just became this really beautiful economic ecosystem and community. Um, next slide. So on top of just like, um, beautiful books. Um, Co-conspirator Press to me represented a, a, a very marked dis distinction between the education that I received in graphic design, which was Eurocentric, everything is Helvetica, everything is clean, grids, um, order, and universality. And this press became a space for me to start to think about graphic design as a form of self-expression. And I think a lot, a lot of times graphic designers are not artists because we kind of pretend that we don't have a form of self-expression, but um, through the press, I was able to explore that we actually do, and we can be artists, and we can use typography as a means of artistic communication. Um, next slide, please. And so now I've moved back to Mexico City. This is where I am currently. And I've started up a new press called Impresos Mexico. And kind of the idea behind Impresos Mexico is to explore feminism specific to Mexico, which the protesting movement in Mexico has been so strong for feminists. Um, I've used kind of I now use typography um, to express kind of my political opinions around that. It's also a space to explore Mexican identity somehow. I'm not sure yet how I'll do that, but I want to. Um, and yeah, in general, I think just to close, one of the most important things to me about printmaking is yes, politics, but also having fun. And I think sometimes when we talk about activism and politics, it becomes very overwhelming. Um, so I try to have as much fun as possible. And I think that's actually something that leads straight into Ashley's work, because I think actually your work is really beautiful. And yes, please go ahead, Ashley. Thank you so much, MJ. I love that intro. Um, I also have your book, uh, decolonizing nonviolent communication. So it was great to see that there. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ashley or Ash. Um, I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, which is where I am right now. And my work um, definitely is based in both places and really reflects that, especially in this piece that I'll get into. But I just kind of wanted to introduce my art um, by, you know, looking at my practice, I've realized that my art really serves like three roles for myself and for community. Um, the first is really drawing attention to social movement work that organizers have been working in racial justice, environmental justice, and queer liberation and the intersections of all of those. Um, the second role is to really personally express my own rage, anger, emotion, glee, whatever I'm feeling at the moment. And I think that it's really plays a role in my own mental health. And the third role, and you know, it's not always like sectioned off to one of these three, it could be all three or different combinations, but is to provide um, a space for, for people, especially for organizers and activists to be able to dream and hope for better futures by trying to paint them and draw them and help us all to kind of vision ourselves in futures that are accessible. And so I'll start with this piece that I created in 2019 um, when all of the Mauna Kea protests and activations were happening on the big island of Hawaii and um, the Kanaka native activists were occupying their rightful land on the top of Mauna Kea to protest the building of the um, 30 meter telescope, which would desecrate a really sacred site. And as a person who's local to Hawaii and a non-native person, I wanted to do something to support the work there. And so when I was um, 
commissioned by Celebrate People's History to create a piece of work that would kind of archive the moment of I chose to do it around Mauna Kea. And um, in this piece, I worked collaboratively with a filmmaker who was creating um, a documentary called Standing Above the Clouds. And so these are all based on images of um, women organizers who are on top of Mauna Kea at the moment. So we see people like Pua Case who have been really vocal about um, protecting Hawaiian land and culture. And this piece, um, was printed as a screen print, but it was actually created in on my iPad. So it really shows the flexibility of mediums. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this piece I created, you know, really to express what was happening in my heart at the time of deep pandemic and the uprisings after George Floyd's death. And this was a different technique for me. It was, for me, it was uh, paper cuttings along with digital illustration on Procreate. And I really just wanted to capture the fire that was happening in a lot of our hearts. And um, this feeling, you know, I think at that moment we felt, at least I felt that anything was possible. And I think a lot of that fire has unfortunately died down for a lot of people. But to me, this piece is really indicative of the emotions of that moment. Next piece, please. Um, this piece, I think, really goes back to um, how I said my art kind of works to draw attention to social movement work. At the time, I was helping to organize um, to get Jackie Lacey out of office. For those of you who are in L.A., you probably know that she, under her occupation of the DA office, over 600 people were killed by LAPD. And so there was such a big movement led by Black Lives Matters and other organizing groups to try to get her out of office and elect a more progressive DA. Um, and so this piece was created for social media to try to get people to get out and vote for different measures. And, you know, local politics, I think, can be really unsexy and doesn't get a lot of traction. So I wanted to do what I could um, with social media posts, wheat pasting, and really getting more information out there for people to um, take action at the polls. Uh, next slide. This piece uh, I created to um, encourage my community to not give up hope. It was a um, interpretation of Faggots and Their Friends Between Re Revolutions by Larry Mitchell and Ned Asta. And it was just, basically produced as a Rezo print and I mailed it out to all my friends to try to gather a little bit more hope um, during really dark times of the pandemic. And I'll wrap up there because I think I'm running out of time. Um, I think this is, it was really, you know, I, I spoke with you all separately before this, but it was really great to, to hear your presentations together because I think there's a lot of, a lot of themes that I think we can get into today, both about um, printmaking and activism, but also around issues of access and expression. And I know that those are um, important, have, you know, play important roles in, in all of your practices. Um, but I wanted to start, since this is part of our LA print series, um, and over the years it's explored many dimensions of printmaking um, in Los Angeles. And, and this year I think we're really um, continuing to push those boundaries of traditional printmaking. Um, but all of you engage with print um, in what, you know, is ostensibly a digital age. And I'm interested to know what draws you um, to printmaking and, and to print culture? Um, and why, um, as somebody with an activist practice, um, what, you know, what interests you um, in these forms of communication? And maybe um, we'll start with, let's go in reverse order. Ashley, do you want to, do you want to start? Sure. I think out of the three of us, I probably have the least experience with printmaking. Um, I'm a self-taught artist and I kind of just fell into it. And so a lot of what I make is digital. Um, but I think kind of through like luck and happenstance, I shared a studio with Cynthia Navar Navarro, who runs Tiny Splendor. And she taught me a lot about Rezo printing and helped me to produce. Um, and I I had always admired it and thought that it was such a beautiful medium, but really got to see firsthand how accessible it makes art and um, that 
the little um, printout that I showed in um, my last slide that I sent to all my friends, I was, we were able to produce those like really cheaply and I could just like send them out to everyone. And so many friends wrote back at how much it had kind of like lifted their spirits during a really hard time. So I think the ac accessibility aspect of it is um, really impactful and made me love printmaking. And I think I'm, I'm personally still learning so much more about it. I think because of a lot of, a lot of my work is made digitally. Um, it can be shown in many different mediums, but definitely seeing my work in print is so tactile and like seeing it away from social media always makes me happy because it feels more real. And I think we can get more into the different aspects of like seeing, having things as actual living objects versus the impact of it on social media. And that's something I'll be interested in talking about. Well, that's um, that's an interesting point that you make that you sort of started digitally and went to print. Um, so maybe um, we'll jump to Alvaro, who obviously um, your the earliest works you showed were done you know at self help you know in in a print studio, but then you also showed works that you you translated that same visual language to to works made digitally. And I'm interested to know you know why why did you start with print and and what has it meant to you um, to expand that practice? Sure. I mean, I think my my initial interest in printmaking was really just seeing the breadth of political critique that was articulated through printmaking. It, it appealed to me in a way that most or met much contemporary art didn't at the moment. At the time, uh, I think I've softened up to to the the ways that political critique can be articulated in contemporary art practices. But at the time, I was really taken by that. But I think also because I do work on a lot of traditional prints still in my practice, I, I kind of I, there's this perverse joy in the anachronism of something like relief printing. That is, it's in a way it's anti-capitalist because it's not about producing the highest amount of profit. It's about slowing down really because a print can take me anywhere from a week to a month depending on how intricate it is so you know now that i have uh, uh, a full-time job i can focus on printing things that i care to make that i want to exist in the world as opposed to thinking about some commercial imperative uh, and i also want to throw in you know one of my appeals to printmaking is its history in the trades you know i i think that in contemporary art practices printmaking it still has a bit of a it's been relegated to a subcategory in art in a lot of ways because it's considered a craft a trade not serious art in a lot of respects so there was something uh uh, contrarian that that appealed to me in that that it, it's not an art form that is going to be perceived the same as say as an oil painting but then there's possibility in that because it has none of that baggage or it has less baggage so that's something that really appeals to me Um, that's really interesting, and, and I think a good a good uh, segue into um, to MJ. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Coming at this from the um, perspective as a designer, as somebody who's coming, you know, in a sense from from that relationship with, with trade, um, but taking your work in a different direction. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's definitely this power dynamic between those who create and those who do, and it comes from a capitalist ideology of the labor is not uh, considered as valuable as kind of the the artistry behind it. And that's something that I've had to reckon with too, coming in, I moved to LA to do a master's degree in graphic design. So it's very much always just been like graphic design, graphic design, and this is the best, um, you know, kind of medium that I could be working with. And when I started making books, kind of my idea behind, I started making books and I started hearing these terms, like it's a zine, it's a zine. And I, it would kind of rub me the wrong way. Like, why are you calling it a zine? It's a book. And then I had to really, understand that that was capitalism inside of me speaking and kind of seeing certain um, objects as less valuable than what I was trying to produce and why was it more valuable because I studied graphic design or something so of the slides that I was showing the first project where I was working with the printmaker was there where I started to really realize like there's absolutely no distinction and printmaking and the labor of printmaking is um, just as valuable as whatever is being communicated. That being said, I don't consider myself a printmaker. I don't have the personality for it. And even with Riza printing, 
I actually, Ashley, uh, Cynthia Navarro has been my mentor too with Rezo Printing, and I'm so thankful to, to Cynthia for everything that she's taught me, including that I am just not a printmaker, and that's just not what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but I have a deep respect for the process of printmaking, like you were saying, Alvaro, like to produce something in an anti-capitalist way because it is bringing you joy, the time it takes you, instead of just like quickly, quickly, let's make this. Um, I also have a full-time job, like the idea of transparency behind an art practice is also really important to me. So when I don't have to work my full-time job, I'm enjoying the process of printing something that I like and I think is valuable. So I print as a means of communication, not, um, not I'm not very good at it, but I do it, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that that, um one of the things that I think is really interesting is that sort of naturally um, collaborative nature of printmaking that it often is, you know, somebody, an artist or a designer working with, with a, you know, printmaker and, you know, that sort of aspect of skill. And I, I think um, one of the themes that came up a lot in our conversation, in your presentations and also our conversations beforehand um, was this issue of, of access. Um, and I'd love to hear more about about that subject, you know, both in terms of the accessibility of, of print, printing and art making tools, um, but also um, the ways that you make your work, the work you do accessible. Um, and how does that inform, you know, the work that you make, what what um, media you choose to to create it in um, at very, you know, for various projects um, and, and how you make it. Um, and maybe, um, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in or I can call on somebody. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have strong feelings about accessibility because coming from a graphic design background, accessibility is one of those terms that they throw around in graphic design school as everything must be accessible. And I, I don't have the vocabulary at the time to question it this way, but now I question that education is like accessible for who or how or where or when. Um, so I've always had an issue with kind of this idea of accessibility to all, but then applied to Rezo printing and just distribution of content that is important. Um, as a graphic designer, I, I try to, you know, I know rules about legibility and things like that um, in graphic design, but I also try to incorporate some fun too. Um, I think that makes things more accessible, not just like clean gridded, but it's fun, please come in. Um, and then there's the whole aspect of pricing your work, which is, you know, it's a whole interesting um, subject matter. But in general, Rezo printing has been really interesting to me because the price of production is really low. So just economically, accessibility is always at the forefront, um, which is important because we want to get the, the information in the books out there as much as possible. So that, that yeah, that's kind of just my thoughts on accessibility. Uh, that's something. Cool. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was actually gonna to call on you because I think that this issue of of color and welcome, I think, is one that really speaks to your work, Ashley. So definitely. Yeah. yeah thank you, Stacey. I think. Um, I mean, I kind of started to do my work because I wanted to make information more accessible to people who might not be as involved in politics or. You know, I I named local politics, for example. There isn't. It's not like wow, I'm going to look up these ballot measures because it's like an intrinsic desire that I have. So how do we make this information a little bit more eye catching, something that people might share on social media, something they might share with their family or friends, um, because like uh, the, the document explaining bills isn't like really attractive or accessible to a lot of people. So I think that's one aspect of it, like making um, political movements a little more accessible to people who might not immediately have an interest in it by making that beautiful and a little more eye-catching. Um, and then I also think about like the accessibility of a lot of our work and a lot of our graphics as printmakers and artists who work in social movements. I feel like the anti-capitalist nature of it, of making it easy for people to download and print themselves. Like when I looked at the piece that I did for Mauna Kea, like, you know, I didn't copyrighted or trademarked because I wasn't trying to make money off of it. And so the image was widely available. So people on the Mauna, people like around Hawaii, even though I wasn't there at the time, I saw on social media that people were just like printing it out themselves and putting it on poster boards in their neighborhoods, which is so beautiful to see. I think that's like the, the, the biggest thing that I could wish for is people resonating with something enough to um, produce it on their own. And for that to be 
okay, you know, like you don't see that a lot of museums, that's not the goal of most art in museums for everyone to be able to disseminate it how they wish. Um, so that's something that really stands out to me as like a goal of mine. Like how can you create something that people have access to and are able to produce on their own? Um, kind of like what you were saying about Ernesto's work with Amplifier. I think they do a really good job of that. And they commissioned some of my like, earliest works when I was just getting started um, to pay me to make art that they could then disseminate to a bunch of people. Um, and it's an interesting model because first of all, I mean, printmaking has such a history of craft, but you're losing control of it, right? You don't control what the final product looks like um, in that situation, but also um, you're turning over some sense of ownership where people, it, I think it takes a new, people take a new sense of control over it that it means something to them in a way that, I mean, artwork always can connect with people and mean something, but I think when, when people are taking it and producing themselves, that's sort of a different relationship with it. Um, which I think is, is really interesting um, in that model. And it's one that um, in, in the exhibition, um, you know, we're looking at, at things even from as far back as um, you know, the early 2000s around, around the Iraq war. And I think that's only become um, a larger and larger um, part of the space. Um, Alvaro, I'm interested to hear your thoughts um, on access as well. Yeah, I mean, I think this question of accessibility is, is really central. I think that I, I've struggled with this question of accessibility because I think the, the fact of the matter is I live under capitalism and I need to be compensated for my labor in some shape, form, or you know, way, shape, or form. So I think initially I was drawn to printmaking because just if you're trying to earn a living from it, you know, you can price your work in a way that is much more affordable than say a one-off piece. If I produce an addition of 50 prints, I can spread out the costs and try to make that money back for myself and, and get paid for my labor, uh, which is important. I have to eat, I have bills to pay. But I also think that the question of accessibility early in my career, you know, I used to say when I first started grad school, I want to make art for people who don't want to step into art galleries. And I think that lately I've been, I've been entering more in the, the realm of the fine art realm, because I think there's something formally very interesting about it that I, that I can't do uh, in a traditional print. Thus my installations, I get to make weirder stuff. But I do, I still stick with this notion that I want to make artwork that isn't just for the person who has a knowledge of art history, is not just for the person who has access to the specialized knowledge of art and design. Um, you know, the, the best example that I have of this, uh, when I was doing my MFA in printmaking here at Cal State Long Beach, I want to do a shout out. Um, I, I was in a student show and I had this workup that was very much traditional printing figuration, you know, telling stories about colonization. And when I was standing in the gallery, um, I saw a, a person who I read as Latinx and I went up to talk to them because I, I could see, I could tell they were speaking Spanish or somebody. And so I went up and had a conversation with him and I asked him, you know, what do you think? And he said, you know, this is the piece that speaks most to me because I see myself in this. And so that is the spirit that I try to keep moving forward still that I think it's really important uh, especially as somebody like myself uh, with this background in, in a place like self-help graphics and art, it's really about making art that speaks to people's lived experiences. And it's really hard to do that when you're hiding behind formal play in a traditional uh, formalistic art practice, if that makes sense. Not to, not to downplay the importance of formalistic play. I think there's an important political critiques that can be articulated through fine art practices. But for me, I really like this idea uh, really, I mean, you know, my father was an undocumented immigrant. He finished up until about fifth grade. And so at the back of my mind, I'm making artwork that I can show to my dad and he can say, oh, I get this. And I know that maybe that is reductive and, and, and I have to be careful not to try to, to, to flatten people's subjectivities. But that is something that I think about frequently. I think um, that, that um, point of communication is a really major one, um, especially in this kind of work when, you know, so much of this work is about, you know, about reaching people where they are and about movement building. Um, and so um, sort of as our last question before we open it up um, to the audience, I'd be interested to know sort of to talk more about each of your relationship with activism. You know, do you consider yourself an activist and what does that mean to you? And what is your, I know some of you, um, I know uh, both, I think 
yeah, I think all of you talked about sort of your relationship to, you know, sort of more formal movements, but sort of how do you think about your work and what, what, the, what is the role of the artist um, in, in the practice of activism? I don't know if anybody wants to jump in or I can call on somebody. All right, go, go for it. I'll, I'll go first just because I, 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 I think that MJ's work and Ashley's work is, I think, more directly related to social movements. I think for me, I struggle with the idea of me being an activist because I think that when I think of activists, I think it's people on the ground who are doing the, the daily grind of what it means to resist oppressive practices and policies and state institutions. I see myself hopefully as an ally that tries to amplify those voices. So oftentimes my research does involve sometimes academic reading, sometimes following, uh, you know, Gen Z teaches me a lot about queer liberation, let me tell you. So that is that that is something that, that informs the work that I do. I look to learn from activists, but I also try to decenter myself because I think that there's something egotistical about the artist who says, you know, look at my work, look at me, look what I'm doing for the movement. I would much rather amplify the voices that are taking place in those movements and count myself as an ally than to try to center myself as an activist artist, if that makes sense. Um, Ashley, I see, I see you snapping your hands in support. Do you have um, anything you want to add to that? Oh, me? Me or MJ? I think um, we were both. I saw right. you snapping your fingers, so I, I was okay. thinking on you, but if you don't want yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would. I really second what Alvaro said. You know, um, I think like around 2016, there was a lot of talking about like art, artists are activists and like all of this, this, um, all of this talk about that and really like going hard on that point, but I really agree with what you said about, I think when I think of activism, I think of people who are on the front line or not even on the front line, but who are really in the daily grind of um, organizing and making this stuff happen. And the best that I could hope for is to be an accomplice to them. Like when I make a lot of these pieces, I am talking to organizers and asking them what they need from me instead of assuming. And I think like when I really first started doing my practice, I was just trying to respond to anything and like posting all this stuff and um, slowing down as you know now that we're in 2022 and a, a lot of my perspective has changed I like to just talk to organizers who are both in LA and Hawaii and asking them what would be the most helpful for you and your movement right now like what what do you need help fundraising do you need help with political graphics where do you want it to live how can I step into that role of just kind of like being a tool to that you can work with and I think that um, that's really important for for artists to do and when people like I kind of I describe myself as a movement artist more than an activist and I feel like sometimes I have to explain what that means because people think I'm like a dancer or something and I'm like no 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 I, I work within social movements and I, I work with organizers but I, I just love everything that Alvaro said because I think it's important for us to like step away from our own ego as artists like I think at one point I felt like I had to respond to everything and realizing that once you decenter yourself, like there are so many voices here and to not have to take up so much space. There are things that you can do, but sometimes you can step back and let other 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 artists talk about it too, you know? There are so many people um, creating art and creating messaging, there's room for everyone. Yeah, um, I love hearing what both of you just said. I it's really resonating with me. And then at the same time, I kind of feel like my vision of an activist is a little bit different. I feel like to be an activist, I consider myself an activist and I consider myself an activist because being here in Mexico in the feminist movement, it's something that directly affects me. And I don't need to be a victim of feminicides or massive violence to understand how terrible it is. And I actually encourage any gender identity to consider themselves an activist in the feminist movement, because what I think about activism is the more we are, the better. So sometimes I consider my activism to be, um, you know, of course I'm making this book and I'm working with this artist and we're doing this and it's like political and it's intense. And sometimes I consider activism to also be, I'm taking care of myself today because I had to see on the news that seven little girls just went missing because this is the country that I live in. Um, and so I think, yeah, for me, this notion of like the activist that's out like screaming and pushing and shoving is super important. And there's so many women here or just people here in Mexico who are 
breaking windows and writing on the walls and I so admire them. Um, and I agree, it's like, what can I do to support? So when we go protesting, it's like, I'll make posters. If you want to take them, please take them. And let's, you know, let's just make a mess. That's what we're trying to do. Um, but I think to be an activist is to have a political intention. And I think everything that we do is political. Like our existence is political, right? Like the people who are here on this panel, like our existence is political. So for your, for your one to walk outside and feel good about being in our own skin is somewhat of a form of activism. It's like, I'm, you know, it's like, I'm living my, my best self despite the entire world cis heteronormativity telling me that I should not exist. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, it's a little bit more like personal than like what I do with my work, but I come to this notion that graphic design and me as a person isn't like, I am a graphic designer and then I am this and that, it's more like a conjunction. So, yeah. Um, I think that's all of your responses are, are really interesting. And I, I think um, this question of the relationship between the person and, and the movement um, is an interesting one. And it leads really well into our first question um, from the audience here, uh, which is what is your creative process? Is your art an outlet for personal expression or directly to send a message or both. Um, and so I'd be interested to know, I know expression came up um, in a few of the presentations also. Um, I don't know if I'm I'm unmuted ready. so I can go. Go for it. <laughs> um, I think, it, I'm not sure this question fully applies to me, just I know I'm saying that I'm an artist because I'm a designer, but the reality is I'm, I'm a designer. So it, there's not that much room for self-expression. Um, what I try to do as a designer, as a form of self-expression um, and process is think about the tools that I have at my disposal. So as a designer, I have typography, I have the content, I have, if I'm making books, I have the paper, the, the binding options, and I try to think of those more um, deliberately. So I try to only work with typefaces made by women and try to find typefaces made by queer folks or people of color, just, it's bleak out there, it's really hard. So any kind of underrepresented community would be good. Um, try to work with uh, binders who, you know, just like politically align with what I align with. Um, so I think like my process becomes very pragmatic, which I guess is indicative of me being a graphic designer and just being very structured. Um, and then there's also something that has come up for me, it's just my background being from Mexico City and how this city is so intense and so colorful and so saturated and so beautiful at the same time. And I found that a lot of my design work kind of relates to that visual language. Um, so at first I didn't realize that I was doing that and now I'm trying to really dive further into that. So I guess my process is a little bit of both like very analytical and very representative of where I come from. I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead. Ashley, you want to go first? Okay. Uh, no, so I think for me, the answer is pretty simple. I think it's both. You know, it, it is very much a form of self expression. But um, like MJ is saying, as artists, our existence and what we do and how we inhabit the world is political. And uh, I think that when I'm creating an artwork, I, you know, I always ask myself a question that my grad advisors used to ask me way back when I was a PhD student, which is what is at stake, right? What is at stake with what you're making? And that's a question that's always in the back of my mind. What is at stake and why does this matter? You know, not only why would somebody want to look at this, but what stories am I tapping into that help me articulate not only my expression as an artist, but my expression as a living thinking person who is, you know, living under uh, under oppressive systems. I would also say both. I feel like that's kind of all of our answers, right? <laughs> um, because our art is inherently subjective, you know, like for, speaking for myself personally, I'm not gonna create something on an issue that I don't, personally care about so you know even if this isn't if I'm creating or for a group that isn't necessarily my own identity it's something that I care deeply and personally about so I'm expressing my views and beliefs 
you know, some of my artwork is just personal as well. You know, in, in the last couple of years, I realized I had to have like a separate practice just for my own personal expression that isn't just reactive to what's happening politically, um, but also just things that would affirm my own identity as a queer person, as a mixed person, and like make myself feel comfortable and safe in my skin and the world that I want to live in. And so it's both. And um, yeah. <laughs> No, I think I think it makes sense, and I think it says a lot about all of all of your practices that they are um, functioning at so many different levels. And I think that that um, that bringing yourself and your own your own um, expression into the work um, is part of what speaks to people. Um, and it looks like we have one more um, question, sort of building off of that one, which is um, how do you balance your personal expression and the need to be understood um, and read by an audience? And do you ever feel that you have to express sacrifice expression for legibility? Um, and I'm interested to hear. I know legibility came up, in MJ, in your in your presentation. Um, yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, yes, of course, because legibility, just the idea of legibility, comes from this notion of universality. Like everyone has to be able to read it. And in my own experience, especially with book design. I, um, I've, I've spent half of my life kind of thinking in English and in Spanish. And so I feel like I don't speak either language fully and then I'm super dyslexic. So just reading, I, I can't read. And so these ideas of like, it has to be legible. I'm like, well, for who? Cause I'm not gonna read it no matter what you, you know, you know what rules you tell me. Um, so it happens a lot in just like my graphic design work where I'll be like, ooh, nice, pink and, and red. And people will be like, you can't read that. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's like forms. The forum is letting you read it. Um, I think that happens more obviously with the work that I do for profit and to pay my bills. And then when I choose to do work for myself, I know what I'm trying to say. And so I... I guess the legibility part of it becomes a little bit more subjective, perhaps maybe even like emotional. I do feel that graphic design has the potential to like be expressive in like a, you know, just like the shape of typography, the colors, the composition, it doesn't really matter what the words are saying. Um, but I'm only able to do that when I know what I'm trying to say. And so I put it on a page and then I can read it. I don't know how effective it is, but then that doesn't really matter if it's effective or not. I don't know. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think the graphic design perspective is very like, of, of course, legibility is important. I think this is a really good question because I think it's something that I've maybe not exactly in these words, but kind of struggled with in the past couple of years because I feel like I know exactly how to make a graphic that could like go viral on Instagram, for example, like if the goal is to reach a lot of people, I know exactly what to make, what format to do, what words to use, how big it should be. Um, but that has felt like so bad to make recently because I've just done it so much. So I feel like when I'm making things for my own personal expression, I typically like won't do lettering on it. I'll, I just want it to speak for itself. And so the work that I make for myself looks a little different than the work that I'm making to try to get a point across. Like if I want something to really get seen by a lot of eyes, then I kind of have like a algorithm, not an algorithm for it, but like a template almost like in my brain. I'm like, okay, you say the main message here, you put the picture here, you do these colors, this font, people will like that. And something about that feels kind of cheap to me recently. So I don't do it as much, but I feel like it, it depends on what the goal is. Is the goal to really express myself or is the goal to get people to vote for something, you know? And I think both can be true and we use those things in different circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also a great question. I think for me, it depends on the projects. I think different projects are, I'm trying to achieve different things. You know, when I showed the image that I made, for the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, I was aiming for legibility. I wanted people to look at it, understand it, and get the message. Uh, I think one of the reasons why I've turned to installation lately and the weird stuff I've been making is because I wanted more freedom to not worry about, is this making sense to somebody? You know, so in a way, I'm kind of contradicting myself. I want to make art for people who, I used to say that I want to make art for people who don't go to galleries, but now I'm like, 
well, maybe that's not always a bad thing because it gives me the freedom to experiment in ways where I don't have to worry about whether or not somebody is going to understand it. It gives me the opportunity. Uh, yeah, actually, I think you can do both. And it gives me the opportunity to really explore the, the way out there ideas, which is why I still in my practice, I still do traditional printmaking, but then I also do my other weird stuff. It, it's like I would get bored if I only did one thing. I just I want to add, like, I think that all of us are kind of like feeling both things and like, it's okay that it's not a binary. Binaries suck, you know, in all aspects. So in, like we, I feel like we all embrace kind of like a non-binary way of thinking around this. You can do both. You can do some, sometimes some, the other times it's not like black and white. Absolutely. And I think that that's, that's what makes all of your practices interesting is that you're, you're drawing from many different places. It's, it's not one thing or the other. Um, and with that, um, I note that we're at time, but thank you. Um, Thank all three of you um, for such a rich, in interesting um, conversation. And thank you for the powerful work that you make, um, whatever form it takes. Um, and thank you, everybody, um, for joining us tonight um, for LA Print. Join us thank again you. next year. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>